crypto. Oh, it's very like, it's very bright here. The sun's like right through the window there. I'm like, I'm even wiser than usual. Oh my gosh. Okay, I'm going to sit back here. Welcome to the show, everyone. This is the weekly crypto recap. We go over all of the latest news from the week and there's a lot to talk about today. And I noticed someone has already disliked the video. Um, I'm wondering if that's because of the frozen posters in the background. Um, maybe, maybe they're not a fan of the Disney movie, but that's fine. It's not to everyone's taste. Uh, I am currently uh, bringing this broadcast to you from Toronto. I'm currently in Canada, so I, I've been traveling around a lot. Uh, story of my life. And this is where I'm doing today's live stream. I'm in Maya's room. So thank you, Maya, for letting me be here today in this, uh, in this room uh, with this frozen posters and lots of uh, fun things on the bed. It's delightful. So all the serious crypto news from this delightful uh, Maya's bedroom. Uh, hi to everyone who's tuning in here. It is wonderful to see all of you here. Now, an overview of what I'm going to be talking about today in the show. So Patrick Byrne has resigned as the CEO of Overstock. So we'll talk about that and the events that led to that. We've got Tether which is known for releasing their USDT. I always, I always mix that up, USTD, but it's actually USDT. USTD is something different. So they are well known for that. It is, of course, the um, USD stable coin that they released. Now they're thinking of releasing uh, a stable coin that is pegged to the yuan. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Also going to go over the latest news from the Tether Bitfinex uh, case that is going on and their fight uh, regarding jurisdiction, whether or not the New York Attorney General has jurisdiction to be going after them. We're going to be talking about the US Treasury blacklisting some more Bitcoin addresses, how useful that is, um, how effective that is, and all of that sort of stuff. Regulation in general, we have the US Secretary of State saying that crypto should be regulated like SWIFT, so they're talking about what exactly that means. BitMEX that have started to block more IP addresses. Um, also, there was some earlier news about BitMEX. I don't know if you'll remember the, the advertisement they put out on the, on the 10th anniversary and the newspaper. It was brilliant. Uh, but I'm going to be talking about that because there was a court decision not too long ago about that. We've got Libra news. Lots of Libra news. So we've got a potential antitrust uh, case going on. Uh, we've got competition from the marketplace, some big players looking to, to release something that could compete with that. We have uh, partners with the Libra. Uh, Rumour has it that some people are going to be pulling out. So talk a little bit about that. Talk about a latest Coinbase glitch that happened. So is your password actually safe there? We will uh, we'll go over that. And that's basically it. A couple of other things I might go over at the end if we have time. But let us start off here. Uh, hi, hello, all the people. Sorry, I'm just uh, just saying hello to all the people in the chat there. Um, I'm going to start off with Patrick Byrne. So Patrick Byrne, he is well known in the crypto space because Overstock was one of the largest and most well known online retailers to accept Bitcoin a long, long time ago. I believe that it was 20, oh, 2014 that that happened. Let me look that up. Um, uh, but they have been, Patrick Byrne has been an outspoken critic of the traditional financial system. He has been a big friend of crypto. He's been involved in crypto. He was working on a, in a partnership with someone to look into land titling, putting land titles on, on the blockchain, all of that kind of stuff. And now he has just resigned from Overstock. And this is big news. So uh, he, they cite instability there. And it has to do with a, an, a, a, a romantic relationship that he apparently partook in. Uh, so I'll go over a little bit uh, about what that is all about. So on Monday, there was a press release released from Overstock itself that actually set the stock plummeting at like 30%. So in this release that was released, release that was released, oh my gosh, it's Maple. They say, see, uh, Overstock.com CEO comments on deep state withholds further comment. So what does this actually say? Um, Sarah Carter has published two articles relating to the following claims of mine. One, starting in 2015, 
I, operating under the belief that I was helping legitimate law enforcement efforts, assisted in what are now known as the Clinton investigation and the Russian investigation. In fact, I am the notorious missing chapter one of the Russian investigation. It was the third time in my life I helped the men in black. The first was, and let me just reiterate, this is a press release that was released by Overstock.com. All right, it kind of sounds a little bit, a little bit um, crazy. All right, um, it was the third time in my life I helped the men in black. The first was when my friend Brian Williams was murdered. There's no space there. Probably should have spell check that before they set this out. Uh, and the second was when I helped uh, men in black shake up Wall Street a decade ago. Unfortunately, this third time turned out to be less about law enforcement, more about political espionage conducted against Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump, and to a lesser degree, Marco, Marco Rubio and Ted Cruz. Number two. In July 2018, I put the pieces together. I immediately, last July, came forward to a congressman and senior military officer to the Department of Justice this April uh, and uh, then she, then he revealed information to journalists and one of these journalists published this information. Her name was, um, was Ms. Carter. Now, all of this, so it's all very convoluted, right? Hi, Anthony. Um, it's all very convoluted. Essentially, what happened was Patrick Byrne met a woman at Freedom Fest in 2015 and ended up having a romantic relationship with her. It turns out that she was a Russian federal agent. He went to law enforcement apparently and uh, told them about this relationship and apparently continued the relationship at their request. All these weird things going on. But long story short, they released all this information in a press release on Monday. Monday. Overstock stocked, dropped 30% and uh, and things went went kind of crazy there. So what has happened since then? So la 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 la. Um, where where does it say? Apparently, when they they said that he was resigning, the stock then jumped. I think jumped up back up like twelve percent, uh, or something like that. So it was like this very strange story that's going on. But Mr. Byrne, I believe he's still be involved with like Medici, but I'm not quite sure what's going on there. I'm going to keep updated on all the things going on there um but like so this is a quote here um mr driscoll wrote a letter to the justice department inspector general and office of professional responsibility on july 25 um and said that the overstock executive had told him that during this relationship with ms butina this is the russian agent apparently um he had acted at the direction of the government and federal agents by at their instruction kindling a romantic relationship with her so it i mean it it's interesting i don't know if anyone else has looked into this this is generally the point in the uh the weekly news recap where i'll hand off to someone else to be like what what do you make of all of this but essentially what we know is that patrick bird who's been a long time crypto advocate overstock has been a long time crypto supporter so he has stepped down as ceo we'll have to see what the next chapter of his life looks like but i'm going to be looking into this whole russian agent story some more i actually reached out to him to see if he'll do an interview but he uh he kindly declined uh but we will see if we get more information on this because he has um he's well known for coming up with some fiery statements <laughs> about things um i had a i had a video interview with him that was picked up by the independent and forbes and a bunch of other publications because of a crazy quote that he said in there where he he talked about the magic ponzi scheme tree I can't remember the exact quote, but it was it was beautifully crafted. And so again, like in this this New York Times article, he cites uh, he calls like the Sith Lord. <laughs> he refers to like the traditional finances um, as that. So he he has some very colourful language. So I will go into that a little bit more, and um, and talk to you a little bit about all of that. So I want to move on. I want to talk about Tether. So Tether, they're embroiled in some controversy as always. Um, because the New York Attorney General is going after them because I don't know if any of you haven't been watching my show. I've been covering this a lot. A very basic quick recap of what's happened is Bitfinex and Tether, apparently owned by the same company, uh, Bitfinex had $800 million or something thereabouts um, that they couldn't get hold of. I believe that it was linked to money that they were holding in a third party 
organization that got frozen because governments are doing that. They're freezing a lot of accounts around the world related to crypto. Um, so they couldn't get access to that. So the, the case that the New York Attorney General brought forward is that, Bit, is that Tether lent Bitfinex $800 billion or, or something and um, no, lent the money to help cover that loss of theirs and there was a cover-up about it. And so the New York Attorney, Attorney General was pretty angry about that and was like, you can't cover this up, even though Wall Street does stuff like that all the time and, and they deliberately <laughs> cover it up. Uh, so there's no bank run or anything. But this seems to be, a put, uh, they seem to have put this forward maybe to deliberately incite a bank run. I don't know. That was, that was one of my theories I brought up in the past. But uh, basically... New York Attorney General is going after Tether saying you can't lend them money and they froze the money and said no more money could be lent between them, etc., etc. Bitfinex pushes back and says you don't have jurisdiction, we don't offer these services to New York clients, etc. Um, so then the New York Attorney General, so they actually just denied Bitfinex's lack of jurisdiction claim. So that is recent news that went on um, over this alleged, sorry, it's $850 million uh, cover up. Now, this was a ruling that happened on Monday. And uh, so as a result of this, Bitfinex is going to have to continue to cooperate with the New York Attorney General uh, and the courts uh, during all of this and they're going to have to make public all the information about the loan that happened between Tether and Bitfinex. So then we've got more bit more Tether news. So while all of this controversy is going on, they've actually just announced that they're going to be issuing a stable coin backed by Yuan at a Belgian bank. So they're issuing a stable coin pegged to uh, the Chinese renminbi. Um, and this, I mean, this is this is interesting. The idea is that they don't want Tether as a as a company doesn't want all of their money just tied to U.S. dollar. Currently, it's very much tied to the U.S. financial system and to the U.S. dollar. And so they're looking to branch out and do what they did in America, in China, for example, so that you can have a stable coin associated um, with the Chinese yuan, which is kind of interesting on a bunch of different fronts. So whether you love tether or you hate it or whatever i say take everything with a grain of salt and just be careful one thing is that it has proven to be very useful for people who didn't want to move their money in and out of the traditional financial system but didn't want to be exposed to the volatility of bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies so having a money that was tied to the stability of the us dollar and it's pretty much kept its peg thereabouts like it's been pretty stable there um so that has provided something useful, a useful tool for people in crypto who wanted to hedge their money and not go in and out of the financial system because it's expensive and cumbersome and awful. Um, so that that is interesting. And obviously there's lots of, you know, uh, there's, there's a lot of hate directed at them, a lot of people, a lot of mistrust there, especially when they went from being like a one-to-one -one backed, um, backed uh, digital asset to saying that now they're going to start, I think it was like two months ago, they issued a statement saying that, oh, maybe three months ago now, they issued a statement saying that they are no longer backing it one-to-one, -one, but it's actually going to be backed by debt instruments and things like that, I presume, because a lot of the tether money was then given to Bitfinex on a loan. So then they changed those terms uh, of agreement. So there's a lot of distrust there. But what is interesting is what's going on in China right now. So, you know, we've got the Hong Kong protests uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that in a second and what's going on there and how BitMEX actually relates to that. But you have people who um, find crypto very valuable there at the moment. And if they could have a, a money that is basically pegged to the uh, to Chinese currency, then that could be a useful tool for people over there, um, people who want more free flowing money than they currently have. So that it's interesting. I mean, I don't know, like, again, I, I, I will abstain from any, any verdict on, on Tether and all of that, but I think it is interesting that they are, first of all, going to be providing that tool for people in China, and second of all, wanting to diversify out of the US, because the US has caused them a whole lot of trouble um, the, this whole New York attorney general, uh, thing that is going on has caused them a lot of trouble. They've had trouble in the past. It's, it's kind of this ongoing issue. So it makes sense that they want to diversify out of that. 
Uh, take it all with a grain of salt. Do lots of research about all of this before you buy into things, but I will keep you updated on what goes on there. Um, so I'm just reading through some of the... Um, the da, 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 da. Yeah, so Cora, yes, it was Boutina. Um, da, 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 da. <laughs> people are asking me questions there. All right, cool, cool. A lot, a lot of people... Well, there are all these strange same questions. Sorry, I get really distracted by the chat because I really like chatting with you guys as well as talking about this stuff. Let's keep going. So I mentioned the New York Attorney General denying the request, um, uh, the lack of jurisdiction claim from then. But now let's go to some more kind of censorship type things coming into crypto from, from government. So the US Treasury has just blacklisted Bitcoin and Litecoin addresses of some Chinese drug kingpins. Let's talk about that for a little bit because this is the second time that they have done this. Uh, the first time that this happened, I believe, was at the end of last year and they blacklisted a bunch of addresses in the Middle East um, that they said were related to nefarious activity and you can't send money to these things, um, to these addresses, etc. And what was the outcome of this? So before we talk about the outcome of this, let's just say like, I don't, I don't like terrorists. I don't like bad behavior. I don't like bad people, all of this. But let's talk about how, <laughs> let's talk about the efficacy of blacklisting crypto addresses, right? The result when they first blacklisted addresses at the end of last year, was these addresses then just got spammed with crypto dust, with microtransactions, people sending them transactions, basically as a big F you. So I shouldn't put my finger up. Everyone makes that into a meme, like the, the Roger Bear one. Um, I, should, I shouldn't do that. I just do it to myself. So everyone sends these transactions to these sanctioned addresses as like a big F you uh, to government officials uh, and basically to prove a point saying that you cannot sanction these. Like you can put whatever you want in writing, but enforcing that is near impossible. And we are going to continue to spam these so that, you know, just to prove a point that you can't control this currency. So that's interesting. Like, as I said before, I don't condone bad behavior. I don't like bad behavior or terrorists or any of this stuff. Uh, I do like that crypto is uncontrollable, though because it also, while enabling bad things, it also enables a tremendous amount of good things. I'm gonna talk a little bit about that in a second related to Hong Kong. So you've got uh, these new three Chinese nationals, their cryptocurrency addresses, they were just sanctioned again. We're gonna have to see the outcome of the US Treasury sanctioning them and whether people again go on the, <laughs> the offensive and are just like, no, you can't sanction them. We're gonna just you know, spam them with all these addresses to prove, all these uh, uh, transactions to prove a point. So these addresses are allegedly, they violated money laundering and drug smuggling laws. And OFAC named, um, oh God, I'm not going to be able to pronounce this, Xiaobing Yan, Fu Jing Zheng, and Guang, Guang Gua Zheng as narcotics traffickers. Um, and under the Foreign, uh, Foreign Narcotics Kingping Designation Act, they have frozen any assets that the, and any property as well that these people own within the US. So, Already you're starting to see power split away there because they were able to freeze assets and seize assets that these people had in the US. With the cryptocurrency addresses, they couldn't seize anything. They couldn't freeze anything. All they could do was write in a piece of paper, these are sanctioned, do not send money to them. And that's as far as their, uh, their power extends there, which I think is just a really interesting turn of the tables. And although I don't like to see bad people doing bad things. It is interesting to see this, this currency get stronger and people really start to see how the tables have turned in terms of the power that people have uh, because the government can't seize these funds. If those people own their own assets, they can't be taken. Um, you know, it's not like they can put pressure on a bank and say, hand over this person's assets because that person probably is their own bank. They probably had on a wallet where they control their own private keys. And so that money can't be taken. So that's just a really interesting lesson uh, that's going on at the moment. Um, now, 
there's I mean it is it is interesting like so talking it was back in November that the first addresses were sanctioned and they were Iranian nationals and actually one of them wrote to Coindesk after that and uh, there was an interview there where they said no this is a mistake my address should not have been blacklisted I mean government makes mistakes all the time and so to blacklist someone's address uh, or to freeze their assets when they freeze their assets there's nothing you can do about it right um so the person the fact that this person responded and said no this was a mistake that i didn't do anything wrong and and they came forward anonymously um to to coindesk um is is interesting because they at least were able to keep their money um if this was indeed a mistake so very interesting things going on here um and then all of these addresses are listed if you wanted to go and, and check those out you can find out the addresses but we'll have to see again we'll have to see the efficacy and the how how um how much power the government actually does have when it comes to cryptocurrency because they can write whatever they want on a piece of paper but when it comes to actually following through that's a that's another story there so moving on um Talking again about regulation, how the U.S. is dealing with all the, all of this, and uh, and I am still trying to. <laughs> Bitcoin is bad behavior. All right, <laughs> Bitcoin is great behavior. It is not bad bad uh, behavior. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit. Oh, and before I do that, so I actually last um, last live stream I was in Denver, and I um, no I was in actually the mountains in Colorado. And everyone was complaining about my microphone because I was with Ashara and I was like, back and forth. And everyone's like, get another microphone. Um, and so I said that I would not, this has been my microphone. I've been using this microphone since 2013 when I first started making uh, crypto, doing cri videos on Bitcoin. And, um, but actually someone sent through a really generous PayPal donation. So maybe I will go and buy a system that can plug into my phone with two microphones <gasps> when I have guests. So whoever that was, huge thank you to you. I really appreciate your support. So Naomi improving her, <laughs> improving her um, equipment for the generosity of people watching the show. Very much appreciated. Um, so let's move on. US Secretary of State says that crypto should be regulated like SWIFT. So what is swift it's basically the underlying structure of, of the financial system like in australia their version of swift is called chess i believe uh, in america it's called the swift system um and so he says that cryptocurrencies should be regulated in the same way as financial institutions and he says that you know we should use a framework that we use to regulate all other electronic financial transactions today. That's essentially what these are. These are monies moving through markets or in some cases in uh, disintermediated transactions. So he says that uh, he concedes that it will be difficult to do. It will be difficult to regulate this, but he believes that it should be regulated like this. Um, now, what's interesting about about this conversation is the cognitive dissonance going on here. So he says like, oh, this should be regulated, la la la. Then they start talking about the Hong Kong protests. They start talking about, you know, a bunch of other things. And then he says that if private transactions become the norm, it would decrease the security of the world if that's the direction we travel. So I take huge issue with this. And I'm just going to go over why. And it all stems from the Hong Kong protests. So just as an overview, if you haven't been keeping up with what's going on there, it's actually remarkable how these protests have been organized. And you have people, basically there, there are these travel cards in Hong Kong and they're all tracked. So you swipe in and swipe out and that's how you travel on the public transport there. And what you've seen is people are literally buying single use travel cards and leaving them out on the machines for people to just take. And people are leaving cash out on the machines for people to just take because they realize that using credit cards or using the uh, ID card that you would usually use to use this, this public transport system, that makes it easy to track the people who are going to and from protests and could lead to um, terrible repercussions for those people in Hong Kong. And people have realized the, the power that following financial transactions holds over people. And so they're saying, well, 
you know, a better way to uh, to do this, a safer way for people to go to these protests and not have these repercussions is to help enable them by giving them more private means of, of uh, transacting. And that is leaving out cash and, and making sure that, that that isn't tracked back to their credit card or anything like that. So the fact that this uh, this person, this US Secretary of State, Mike Pompeo was ta even talking, discussing the New York protesters. And then he, he like, and where we know that this is such a lifeline for people there, it's a tool for their freedom that they have the ability to use cash and cryptocurrency. And you, you've seen a lot of cryptocurrency use there as well. Um, the fact that this has been a lifeline for people and then in the same breath, he turns around <laughs> and says that, you know, private, if private transactions become the norm, it would decrease the security of the world. I mean, it seems to me, I don't know about you guys, it seems like it's increasing the individual's security. Like if you live under a totalitarian regime that is persecuting people and, um, and you're out protesting what, what the government is, is doing, trying to get things changed, um, you know, having private transactions is of paramount importance because it enables you to, to fight against these things and, and fight for the things that you believe in. And so... He's acknowledging, you know, all these things that are going on with the, the New York protests, I mean, the Hong Kong protests, but then saying that, oh, but actually we can't possibly have private transactions because we wouldn't be able to monitor them. And it's this cognitive dissonance where you say, oh, well, you know, the tracking is okay if it's our government because we're the good guys. But it's, you know, it's bad if it's their government and, you know, part of the people and, you know, I hope they succeed. But he literally wants to take away the tools that enable those people to succeed. And I think we have to realise that freedom can be lost in a generation. And there's a lot of persecution going on all over the world, not just in, in Hong Kong or, or China or Venezuela or anywhere else. Um, there's a lot going on where people need the ability to transact privately. And... Uh, and I just, I just think it's terrible when you have people like this come out and say that private transactions are, are bad. I just think that's so wrong because these same, same politicians, if we link it back to, to Libra, they're all talking about how private transactions are really important. We don't want Facebook to get that data and how can we trust Facebook? And I love that line of questioning, you know? I love the fact that people in, in, in Congress are talking about the importance of, of um, financial privacy, but then in the same breath, they're talking about how we still want everything to be tracked by the government because, you know, it gets rid of money launderers and terrorists and, and all that. Um, so it's this cognitive dissonance that we're seeing get worked out right now. I'm not sure what the result is going to be. I hope that these people become more self-aware and realize, um, realize what they're saying and that you can't have one without the other. So his exact quote, he says that you need to be able to track money flowing around the world because it has helped keep the entire world secure and to fight terrorism and other nefarious activity. We need to preserve a financial system, a global financial system that protects that. Um, whew, yeah, I don't, I don't think we want, <laughs> I don't think we want to track global financial system. That's just me. Um, I, I think that it's great that we have different financial tools and people can choose which one they want to use and they can choose more private options if they prefer. And I think that it's very important to protect their private transactions. But anyway, just wanted to let you know about that quote that happened this week from the US Secretary of State. We're going to have to see how all this stuff gets, gets worked out. Um, but I just thought that was worth mentioning. Now, on, in relation to Hong Kong, I want to mention something about BitMEX that's going on right now. So they have actually just added three new ju jurisdictions to its trade restriction list. Now, currently, its trade restriction list includes the United States, uh, Quebec in Canada. We have Cuba, Crimea, and Sevastopol, Iran, Syria, North Korea, Sudan. And then they just added Bermuda, Hong Kong, and Seychelles to that list. Um so this, I mean, first of all, Bermuda is meant to be like a crypto hub of the world, right? And now BitMEX isn't offering their services to Bermuda anymore. So that's crazy to me. Um, you know, we, we keep talking about these bastions of, of hope around the world for crypto. Oh, everyone's moving to Malta. Oh, everyone's moving to Gibraltar and Puerto Rico. And Bermuda is held up as this paragon of, of crypto um, 
of crypto predominance and this this haven for crypto users but now you have exchanges like bitmex saying that they're going to be blocking bermuda ip addresses which is kind of crazy and makes you wonder if we're ever going to have a place in the world where crypto is going to be protected or easier than other places because it seems that no governments around the world really want that and they will put pressure on all these other jurisdictions to make sure that the laws they have in their own countries are enforced across across the world so i don't know it's uh oh boy it's it, it doesn't look good i want to be positive in this uh in this segment but give me something to be positive about um so they say that everything is is done with geo blocks they basically block the ip addresses people get around those all the time they just use um vpns to mask their ip address and make it seem like they're coming from a place that um that has not been blocked and so it seems pretty easy workaround that people are doing at the moment but it is sad that they're now working with re regulators that is going to be putting downward pressure on um crypto innovation and and usage in places like bermuda so um they posted the increased involvement of regulators with all major players in the industry is not only to be expected it is welcomed it is the mission of good regulators to ensure that honest citizens are not being cheated. For this reason, we've decided to restrict access to BitMEX for users in the jurisdictions in which HDR affiliated employees and officers are located. So that's, that's all interesting. Um, I'm also... I'm also sad to see that Hong Kong was added to that list because I think it's so important that uh, people in Hong Kong have access to crypto right now. As we mentioned before, financial privacy is so important and, um, and it makes me really sad to see one more exchange, you know, another barrier put in place that's going to make it harder for these people. It's, it's really sad. And when they're talking about, you know, the mission of good regulators to ensure that honest citizens are not cheated, gosh... That makes me so angry too. Like I, 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 you know, I love the the rhetoric from people like Hester Pierce, who's with the SEC. You know, um, Bitcoin mum, as people like to call her, because she talks about individual responsibility and she talks about how it doesn't matter whether the government gives it a tick of approval or not. You need to be doing your own research. You need to be making sure that you understand what's going on and um, taking responsibility for that. And too often, I think people just presume that they can they don't need to worry about researching things because these these uh uh governments will do it for them and will regulate things and all of that it's just not how it works because people get cheated in the regulated world all the time so there's rhetoric about like how people in the it, by by regulating these industries and blocking out entire ip <laughs> ip areas um that they're protecting people i think is just ridiculous it's delusional <laughs> It's delusional. Maybe you guys have a different opinion. I would love to hear your, your opinion, but I don't see that helping people. I see that as just blocking out entire segments of the world population. And I, I don't like to see that, especially when I, I want to see places like Hong Kong have as many options as possible right now. Uh, I got, ooh, I, <laughs> I got a super chat from Exciting World Cryptos. JR, thank you so much. He sent a message that says, just because this is always positive. Thank you so much, JR. I really appreciate that. If you guys haven't checked out Exciting World Cryptos, uh, so JR actually has a YouTube channel and he sends great content out from the most beautiful locations. I mean, granted, he doesn't have frozen posters like I do, uh, but, you know, he, like, films in front of glaciers and giant forests and waterfalls and <laughs> all these crazy things. So do check out his content. And thank you, JR. I really, really appreciate that. Um... Oh, hit doggy. Next one. So because we're on the topic of BitMEX, I did want to mention like, so who here in the chat saw the advertisement that BitMEX put out January 3rd? It was great. It was so good. It was the 10th anniversary of Bitcoin. And I hope you all had a party. I had a party in Australia. It was really, really fun. One of my friends helped set that up over there. Um, but you saw some giant newspaper articles or advertising campaigns thank you notices to satoshi come out and i just it just warmed my heart i thought it was fantastic so um basically there was a footer on the front page of a national newspaper 
on January 3rd this year that said, thanks, Satoshi, we owe you one. Happy 10th birthday, Bitcoin. And then there was a graph and text next to it and a full page article that was written by CEO and uh, co-founder of HDR Global Trading, Arthur Hayes. You probably all know who Arthur Hayes is because he is uh, a prolific Twitterer um, and part of the cryptosphere. So... Uh, he wrote a an article titled Two Sides of the Coin: The Bivocation Near Future of Money," and I thought I thought all of this was great. It was incredible to see a front page advertisement mentioning Bitcoin, and I love that Bitmex put that out and that Arthur Hayes put that out. I I saw that, and I just you know for something that was so important to me, and to be celebrating the tenth anniversary of something that I think is the biggest step towards freedom we've seen in the last hundred years. I just everything seemed right and everything seemed hopeful and I thought wow this is the direction we're going in that makes me feel great of course there were critics who want to ruin all of the fun and so there were apparently four complaints against the ad that claims that it failed to illustrate the risk of the investment it exaggerated the return on the investment and challenged whether it was misleading. So these people didn't like the advertisement and they went up against it. Now, apparently on Wednesday, uh, I think it was last week, what's today's the, yeah, so it was about 10 days ago now. It was, um, there was a ruling that basically says that, the ruling said that it supported the four co complaints against this ad. And it make me so sad. Like, this is one of the best ads I've ever seen. Um, and, of course, you know, you... Um, yeah, so, I mean, it, the watchdog pointed out that the graph used a logarithmic scale on its y-axis, which meant that the equally spaced values on the scale did not increase by the same amount each time and instead increased by orders of magnitude. All right, so anyone who knows about... Um, anyone who knows about reading charts, yeah, you you probably should always read it with a logarithmic scale. So the fact that people were complaining against that is ridiculous because it actually would compress, you know, some of the giant leaps there. Um, that's, that's the point of it. So that you can actually see the, you know, movements in relation to each other. But I guess what they're saying is that it made it seem like less volatile, which is, is accurate. Um, but it's the way that you should be reading these graphs. So I think, I mean, this type of stuff is ridiculous. Again, it's people wanting to blame other people for them not doing their research. Oh, well, they're misleading people and, you know, they're, um, <laughs> it's, uh, they're misrepresenting things. I, I, I think it's ridiculous. I think it was such a beautiful ad. It was a big thank you to Satoshi. It was a big 10th anniversary celebration. All of us, our, you know, hopes were high and hearts were light and it, I don't know, it just, this made me angry. So, um, uh, so the, basically the ASA said uh, in response, they said, we considered it was a clear promotional statement of Bitcoin's merits and did very little to warn consumers of any risks. Happy birthday, Satoshi. Here are all of the risks. Like, I mean, of course they're not going to say that. It was a happy birthday message. Oh, my God. Um, so they said that they misleadingly exaggerated the return of investment. They failed to illustrate the risk of the investment. Therefore, they concluded it was in breach of the code. Oh, my gosh. I just, I don't know. It's... Uh, like the, so bitmex in the article just so we're clear it did include things like um it's still very much a, an experiment they said that the road ahead will be challenging it mentioned price volatility but all of this apparently wasn't enough and people were really angry about this ad so i'm just yeah i just wanted to mention this because it's um it's it, it's frustrating me to me <laughs> to see this and i just wanted to bring it up Let's move on to Libra because I wanted to, to mention what's going on there at the moment. Um, as we know, I mean, Libra is up against... Oh, is he back? Is he back again? <gasps> oh, he's back again. Are we back? Oh, wait, Rebecca Brock was there. <laughs> she watching her room outside. Uh, so my sister, my sister's downstairs. Uh, I hope she's watching the stream. Um, Beck, if you're watching the stream, feel free to come in and say hi to people. Uh, share your crypto wisdom with them. All right. Looks like we are back, which is perfect timing because I was just about to get started on the Libra stuff. So basically, 
Libra, I'm not convinced is ever going to launch. And I think that there are too many barriers to overcome with regard to it. I think that there, when you have any sort of a centralized um, uh, crypto platform, then, and it, especially if it's as large as Facebook's audience is, I mean, they have reached billions of users uh, worldwide. So this is huge competition for governments. So um, I think that it's just, I mean, in order to get approval from them, they're just going to have to jump through hoops. And they're going to have to keep jumping through hoops. And I just don't see them ever getting approval to launch. But we'll see. I'm not sure. Um, now, <laughs> people want to see Becca. <laughs> yeah. Um, so let me talk about some of the barriers they're already coming across. So we know that immediately you had people like Maxine Waters calling for them to be shut down. And then she launched a hearing uh, with the... There, there were two hearings, actually, that we just had last month uh, against Facebook and against the Libra. And you had... Um, David Marcus was who was in charge of the Libra project, basically trying to explain to them how it all works. And it's very clear that no one, no one at the hearings understood it, um, which was frustrating, but to be expected. And I'm glad that they're learning, but they were also, you know, pontificating and and basically just trying to appear to be doing things to to um, to appease their jurisdictions. I, I believe. So one of the issues we've got. Um, now is that they're facing an EU antitrust probe. So antitrust, the idea that you know someone has too much power and other people can't compete. Libra, Libra is literally competition that's being introduced for the banks. Like, <laughs> Libra is the competition. <laughs> I, I don't know. I just, oh wow. All right, let's talk through this a little bit more slowly. So we've had a monopoly on the money supply for a very long time. It has been a government monopoly. And every time you've had private institutions trying to release their own currency, it has been shut down. You have had electronic forms of money prior to Bitcoin. Uh, Bitcoin was not the first form of digital currency, but previous forms have been shut down by government because government does not like competition. And any time you have a currency that grows large enough to not be considered a novelty, the government finds that very threatening and they shut it down. So literally, the government has been maintaining their own monopoly for a very long time. Now, suddenly Bitcoin comes along and you can't shut it down. It is unable for the government to stop that. They can ban it. They can try to censor it. But, you know, it's a worldwide phenomenon. It's a worldwide te technology. And they, they can put as many things into law as they want, but they can't stop it. They can only discourage people uh, from using it. And it's going to be very difficult for them to, um, to regulate this thing and to monitor it and to uphold any regulations that they put on it. Now... The uh, then so already you have Bitcoin, which is competition for the US dollar and competition for banks, and now you have Libra coming along and saying, Well, we're a private organization, we're a consortium of group of people that includes MasterCard and Visa and PayPal and all these things, um, and we're going to be creating a thing. And now the EU is coming out and saying that, Oh, well, this is a potential antitrust violation, we believe that this consortium is too powerful and <laughs> we need to break it up. So the only thing that's allowed consolidated power is like the Federal Reserve. And that's something that we can't break up because they won't allow any audits of it. They won't allow it to be any transparency there. Like it's just, it's ridiculous. Um, all of this is a, in the, the guy. And of course, I mean, European central banks, I say the, the Federal Reserve, but obviously that's in America. And in Europe, you've got like the same phenomenon, but they've got their version of it in the European central bank. Um, so, I mean, it is, it is kind of, crazy that they're using this talk. I always hate antitrust rhetoric personally. I think it's ridiculous because like, for example, Microsoft is a great, um, uh, a great example of this. The fact that it took them so, many, so long for, to get this mi antitrust case against Microsoft, they had too much power, la la la. By the time they finally got through with all of the court hearings, Apple had already overtaken their market share, which is like just a prime example of how they didn't have this unfair monopoly. And it wasn't that people couldn't compete. People were competing. Microsoft started providing, you know, service that was, was inferior to its competitors. So the competitors picked up market share. So I, I don't know, all that rhetoric always bothers me, but this in particular bothers me. And it bothers me for uh, another reason. And I'll, uh, it was something I was gonna bring up in a second. I'll bring it up now. So, 
they're talking about how how Libra, uh, you know, potentially this antitrust case, potentially this monopoly and it's too powerful. <laughs> then you have the same week we have news from Binance that they have a new stablecoin initiative. So Binance, right? Binance, a giant, giant exchange that basically picked up all of its uh, popularity. Over the course of like a few months, it just rose to the top and became this, you know, giant, giant organization that uh, had, had so much volume being traded on there, so many users. Now this giant organization is announcing they're going to be creating a coin that is very similar to the Libra. So already you have a very powerful organization saying that they're going to provide competition. A, a, an organization that's already in the crypto space, that already has a strong fo fo foothold, that already has a strong user base of cryptocurrency users saying that they're going to be creating a similar product. And yet the EU is saying that, <laughs> that Libra has too much power and there's an antitrust case there. Like, I, th I think it's ridiculous, uh, but that's just my opinion. And uh, maybe you guys disagree. If you do disagree, let me know. I would love to hear your opinion there. Um, so let's talk a little bit about this competitor that Binance has announced. They, uh, they said they're launching a project that will develop current cryptocurrencies and digital assets that are pegged to fiat currencies around the world. And they've dubbed it Venus. Venus. Uh, it will be uh, a localized stablecoin initiative that will see the firm utilize its existing infrastructure. As I said, they've already built out this incredible in infrastructure in the crypto space. So it's going to be building on that and, uh, and, so, and its public blockchain, Binance chain, uh, to empower and develop empower developed and developing countries to spur new currencies. So they're basically using their already developed infrastructure and helping people to spur new currencies based on this. I think it sounds kind of interesting there. And, um, and it says that they're looking for partnerships to assist in this. I mean, the same way that we have Facebook and Visa and MasterCard and Uber and Spotify apparently all joining forces for this other one. You know, Binance is looking for partners for them. I believe that we're going to see Amazon entering the space and maybe they'll do their own or, you know, Alibaba, maybe they'll, Alibaba will team up with people and create their own. So there's going to be a huge amount of comp competition here. Um, the fact that we haven't seen much competition is because I think people knew that what's happening with Libra was going to happen. People knew that there's no way the governments would just accept um a, a new currency, a private currency like this with such powerful players like Visa, MasterCard, PayPal, all these people joining forces to use this new currency. I mean, people knew that this was would be a very threatening thing. So I think that it requires a lot of resources and a lot of confidence for you to tackle this. And Facebook has those resources. And so it makes sense that they would be a trailblazer. And it's funny because this it's the regulators themselves that have cre created this illusion of this antitrust situation because no one else has the resources to to compete with Facebook right now. And Facebook has the lawyers and the money and, and the things they need to fight the government and to try and get something pushed forward. There's no way that a smaller company could do that and has the resources. So it's actually the government regulation that is creating the barriers to entry that are stopping competitors coming into play. And now they're complaining about the fact that there are no competitors at the moment. But now you have uh, Binance coming in and saying, all right, we're stepping into the ring. Um, and then you, you're probably going to see other coins coming up, uh, other companies coming up soon. So I think that the antitrust issue is like a... It's like a non non issue there, but interesting to see what Binance is going to be doing. Um, and another thing I want to bring up about Libra before I move on. So already because of the pushback that they're getting and all of the hearings that are going on and how um, how hard it is going to be and how people are realizing how hard it's going to be for them to push this currency through, apparently backers are considering quitting. So this is a rumor that is, is going around. Um, now the Financial Times put out a report and so they mentioned three firms they didn't name them explicitly but they apparently this the three firms that are part of this consortium that Libra is putting together they've expressed concern over being seen to be linked to a project after watchdogs around the world raised concerns over the potential threat to financial stability I mean financial stability I I feel like that's like saying Uber is very bad because it poses potential risk to taxi stability it's like that's the point <laughs> taxi cabs like the industry is like 
it's expensive and it's not providing good service and we need to shake it up and provide better value for people, better products out there. And Uber comes along and shakes up the entire market, right? And that's how that spurred actually taxi industry to lift their game as well and to start creating mobile apps and to start, you know, providing cleanup vehicles and things like that before they didn't need to worry about it because there was a, a government enforced uh, monopoly or cartel created there. Now, the fact that they're saying that, oh, well, Libro is going to, create financial instability. Um, I, I, I am glad that we have tools out there that are starting to, finan to shake up the financial system because I want to see innovation. I want to see better products. I don't want to see crazy you know, exchange rate spreads. Like when I, when I, um, oh, I'm running out of battery there. When I transfer money from Australia to America and you have to transfer between currencies, if I do that through a bank, it's insane. They say, oh, well, we don't take any fees on this. That's total BS, total BS, because their fees that they're, they are taking is in the giant spread, the giant spread. Like it'll be like 59 cents uh, if you wanted to, to sell the money there. Um, and then uh, if, if, if they're going to buy the money off you and then it's like it's 69 cents if you want to buy it. Like I, I remember the last time I exchanged money, there was like a 4% spread in the cryptocurrency exchange rate. So I want to see this system shaken up and to see people have alternatives. And that mean, if that means going from one currency into cryptocurrency and then out into a different currency so you can avoid losing all of that money, which is a huge amount of money. Um, for people, I, I, I want to see that disruption. I want to see better innovation. I want to see better services be provided. I want to see people being forced to lift their game. So I, it's sad that these, <laughs> these companies are saying, well, we don't want to be linked to a project that has a potential threat to financial stability. Uh, so we will see what, what happens there. Um, none of these projects have been given their names yet. Um, now, the everything to do with the Libra Association and all of the partnerships that they've mentioned, they're all non-binding at the moment. And it's important to keep that in mind um, because these firms are not tied to this. Obviously, this thing is going to be le released for a long, long time and if it is released at all. And, um, and so... There, it makes sense that you know these companies should have the ability to pull out if they don't want to be involved with it anymore because this could be going on for a decade more. Um, but yeah, there is some issue there, um, some issue with some of the, the partnerships that they've apparently um, uh, been coming up against. And then apparently there's another quote that says that um, that... Facebook is tired of being the only people putting their neck out, which is interesting because it is Facebook that is taking on the risk here. They are the ones fighting the regulators. They are the ones fighting to get this private currency uh, established and to have like other partnerships kind of pull out um, who would potentially be powerful allies that I'm sure they were depending on. I, I'm sure that's frustrating for them, but we'll have to see what happens there. Um, and see what happens with these antitrust cases and all the hearings and all of that sort of stuff. So I will keep you updated on that. Um, that is basically all I wanted to cover in today's show here. I've got one more thing that I want to um, to mention. Before I mention that, I have a, um, a super chat from Uvis. Thank you so much, Uvis. It says, Libra fail to launch just reinforces how awesome Bitcoin is. Here, here. No, I think that, I think that, after all of these hearings that have taken place, Libra is definitely realizing the benefit of having a decentralized currency. Now, if you read through the Libra white paper, they talk about why they have this private currency and they say, oh, well, we plan to transition to a decentralized uh, you know, blockchain, decentralized system down the track. I, I think that's not gonna happen. But they say that they plan to, but that the infrastructure just, the technology just isn't there at the moment that would enable them to scale at the level that they need to scale at. I agree with this. I agree 100%. Um, I think that they're right, but they have to realize that there are trade-offs there. So the reason why people go towards Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies like that is not because we think that Bitcoin has all of its scaling needs completely solved and that all cryptocurrencies are scaling completely down packed and it's, it's all perfect. No, there are definite areas of friction there, but people still go towards those currencies because they're decentralized enough that uh, they can't be shut down. And that's the major issue and that's why it's so important. And Libra is now starting to realize the trade-off um, between their scaling and, 
and the ability to be shut down. Because right now, the point is is moot. Scaling is moot for for Facebook because they can't even get a project launched without the government's approval uh, because it's a private system. So I think that's such a good point, Uvis. Um, and we are seeing how important it is. Like primary importance of all of this needs to be a currency that can't be shut down, that can't be censored. I think that that is so important and we're starting to really, this, we're bringing that point home now uh, with all of the Libra stuff that is going on. So yay to decentralized cryptocurrencies um, as opposed to, to private blockchains, etc. All right, so that is um, someone making fun of my, my microphone. Guys, no, it's just a wind. It's like a, it's a, it's a, oh, my sister's telling me that there's pizza here and then our friends are leaving and they're downstairs. Um, to, guys, I can't leave you in the middle of the stream. <laughs> but apparently I've I got to go say goodbye to people out there. Um, but back to the microphone. It's not that big, guys. It's just a little microphone. It's a windbreaker. So that when I go outside and interview people on the street, you don't hear like... <laughs> so I'm not compensating. I, I may be. I may be. But um, it's, it's just a windbreaker. Yeah, and I like big mics. Um, all right, guys. So that's basically all I wanted to mention here. There was like a Coinbase password glitch. Make sure that you're checking your, your Coinbase account if you have one. Um, there, there is an issue there basically when people, there's like, it affects like 3,500 customers, which isn't that many in the scheme of how many people uh, Coinbase is actually supporting, but there was an issue there that like for a split second, things were stored in plain text when people were signing up, if that sign up process didn't go through. So they're checking out that. Apparently they emailed all the people who were affected. Now make sure that you're keeping up with Coinbase emails if you have a, an address there, if you have a wallet there and making sure that you're not affected because you do not want your password stored in plain text anywhere on the internet. So check that out. Make sure that you're, um, you're staying safe there. And maybe if you're feeling ready for it, move your coins to a place where you control the private keys. That could be like a good weekend project for you to just do some spring cleaning, get more security, make sure that if you are ready to make that move, that you have a really safe place to put those, uh, those whether it's hardware devices or paper wallets or cold storage devices or whatever it is, make sure that you understand the security risks and that you know that if you lose your keys, then you've lost all of your Bitcoin. This makes you understand the risks before doing that, but it could be a good weekend for self-education and spring cleaning and taking back control of your money. So on that note, I'm gonna leave you all uh, to go and have a wonderful weekend and enjoy yourselves. And thank you so much for tuning in. I always feel like my live streams a little bit more like, like run on thoughts. <laughs> Cause it's just me with a microphone chatting with you all. And I, I like, it's like, oh, I wanna talk about this. I wanna talk about this. Um, let me know if you like the format of me having people on the show better, or if it's all right to talk about the news by myself. Sometimes I do like single issue things, which I think works well, but would love feedback from you guys because I'm making this show for you. You're the ones who tune in each week. So I want you guys to um, have the best show possible that I can provide you. So tell me how I can do that. Uh, send, me, send me your feedback. I would really appreciate that. You can even send it in the comments below. I would appreciate that or on Twitter or in a DM or however you want to do it. But go have a wonderful weekend. Enjoy yourselves. Uh, embrace the world of decentralized technology, stay free, support uh, important causes you believe in. I'll chat to you guys later. Oh, oh, and I may, I may do like a secret live stream later tonight because I haven't listened. You guys can tune out now if all you're interested in crypto, like just press in now. So the, um, the, I may do a live stream on my other channel that no one's subscribed to. I have like two subscribers. One of them's probably this account um, where I'm got, probably going to listen to the Taylor Swift album for the first time. Haven't listened to it yet. Big important moment for me. So I may just do a live stream reaction video that I may delete afterwards. I don't know. But, you know, maybe I'll share that moment. If anyone wants to tune in and listen to it with me, come hang out there. I'm probably not going to post this link on my Twitter uh, or anywhere. So just go and find it if you want to hang out. Otherwise, crypto people, fly, be free, be wonderful. Guys, Taylor Swift is great. All right, I'm leaving you all. You guys just, it's just her music's great. All right, love you all. Bye. Da, 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 da.